most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. This is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Lead us, guide us, direct us, O God, as we study today, may thy will be done in the name of Jesus. Convict deeply and stir mightily those who are not born again. Those who are born again, but they're not surrendered, I pray that you'll move upon their hearts today and cause them to surrender all to Jesus. And may every Christian be edified and built up in the faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are studying the word suddenly. We're going to study words, various words, as the Holy Spirit leads us for a few broadcasts. And number one is the word suddenly. Now, the birth of Jesus, and I'm just reviewing briefly. Yesterday, I used two passages. And today, we're going to use two or three as time permits. Now, I pointed out, first of all, that centuries before it occurred, the birth of Jesus was announced and prophesied. The place... And everything about it was announced. And then one day, suddenly, the announcement was made, the Savior is born. King of the Jews, unto us a Savior is born, the Son of God. And then I announced that, I gave you the announcement that came suddenly. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. And then one day Jesus told his disciples to go up to the upper room, go to Jerusalem, and you tarry there, and, and you'll be endued with power from on high. And then the Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, not before, not after, but the very day, when the day arrived, suddenly there was a sound. Suddenly there was a sound. Now, keep this in mind. God is never ahead of schedule. God is never behind schedule. God is always on time. He does not always act suddenly. Sometimes he acts over a period of time. For instance, the tribulation will run approximately seven years. The millennium will run a thousand years and so on. But oftentimes God, after centuries, acts Suddenly, the announcement is made centuries before, and then suddenly it occurs. Never before time, never be after time, that is, never before and never beyond, but always on the minute, in the fullness of time, at the appointed time. Now, I gave you the birth, and then on the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit, it was announced in the Old Testament, then suddenly the, the sound came and the Spirit came and they were all baptized. All right. Now then, the next one that I want us to see is in Acts chapter 9. A very, very unique, outstanding, unusual conversion of a man ordained of God to carry the message of salvation to the Gentiles. Saul of Tarsus, he was a devout religionist, he was a dedicated persecutor, and he played havoc with the church. They, the, the, the fellows you remember back in the uh, previous chapters when they stoned Stephen, they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now in chapter 9 verse 1, this is Acts 9, 1, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and desired, that is, he requested letters, or we would say warrants, to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, now that's the Jesus way, if he found any of the Jesus way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly... Suddenly, there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou? And he said, I am Jesus. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And of course, he trembling and astonished. He trembled, and he was astonished, and he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now let me say this, beloved. 
Some of you dear people listening to me today are not born again. You know that your loved ones have been praying for you. Maybe it's a husband, you know, your wife, your mother, and your daddy, and maybe brothers and sisters have been praying for you. Maybe it's a wife, and you know that your husband or your friends and loved ones have been praying for you. And you've rebelled, and you have refused to come to Jesus. Now, I don't know. I don't know what God will do to attempt to wake you up before it is everlastingly too late. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. I believe with all my heart, if someone has claimed you for Jesus, and I believe it's possible to do that. Now, I believe it's possible for a daddy and a mother to pray to God on the behalf of their children and lay those children at the feet of Jesus in prayer, and give them to God in prayer, and I believe it's possible to build up a barrier between that child and hell through intercessory, devout, and conscientious prayer. I believe that. I believe if you claim your son for Jesus, and if you live as you ought to live, and pray as you ought to pray, I believe God will save him. Now, God may be, God may be forced to do some drastic things to bring that child to his senses long enough for that boy or girl to realize that they need God and they need salvation. Now, let me make this clear. I don't want anyone to misunderstand. Not all tragedies where someone is saved as the result of the tragedy, not all such tragedies are in answer to prayer. Now, I believe many are. I believe many are. Don't listen now. Let me tell you what I mean. Don't you ever, if your husband is lost, and you love him so much, and you are so concerned about him, that you feel at a moment that you do anything in the world to see him saved. If you don't mean that, don't you tell God. Don't you say, Dear God, do anything, God. I'll give you anything, God. Just anything. Now, when you pray that kind of a prayer, you'd better mean it. Because God will take you at your word. And when God does everything in love and in tenderness, God gives your husband a good job, a good home, a new automobile, nice clothes, and, and, uh, and nice furniture, and good food, and then a little baby comes along, and it grows, and it's a beautiful child, and then one day... You pray, oh God, I'll do anything. My husband drinks and my husband is not saved and I'll do anything, Lord. I'll give you anything if you'll just save him. Now, don't you ever do that unless you mean it. Because God just might take the most precious thing on earth to your husband. The most precious thing. The thing that he loves dearest and the thing that he would miss most and the thing that would hurt him most to lose, God may just slip it away if you pray that kind of a prayer. Now, why am I saying that? Now, God doesn't knock everybody down that he saves. No. God doesn't take a stick and knock you down. Uh Uh-uh. No, no. But I'm telling you something. You might as well face it. Uh, God Almighty floored Saul of Tarsus. He fell. A light shine around him. He fell to the earth. He fell. Now, some say that he was riding a horse. I don't know. I don't see any horse here. Uh, I didn't say anything here about a horse. I, I, he could have been. I don't know, but uh, I, don't, uh, I don't much believe he was. He could have been. I don't know. But if he was on a horse, he just had a little further to fall. I believe he was walking. And if you'll just excuse me for saying it, so you understand it? God just slapped him flat of his back. Now, you'll forgive me if you don't like that language. Uh, you, you'll just forgive me because I, I'm sincere in it. I'm not sarcastic or sacrilegious. Or, or I, I'm not. I'm saying it because you understand. You say, uh, that daddy slapped his boy down when he sassed him. Well, I never, I never slapped one of my boys. In fact, I never slapped him. I always used a switch. Or a belt. I did not hit my boys with my hand. Now, I think it's all right to paddle a little child. I think it's all right for the mother to paddle a little child. But when it comes to a daddy slapping his child down, I don't believe in that. I believe in chastening. I believe you should whip them. And I believe that school teachers should be given the right to chasten the children in the right way. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. 
But I never slapped one of my boys down. Never. I whipped both of them, but I never slapped one down. But if I use the term, God slapped him down, God knocked him down, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now, Saul of Tarsus was God's vessel, and God wanted to use him, and God intended to use him. Now, this is not fatalism, my friend. No, no. Uh-uh. No, this is not fatalism. Because Saul of Tarsus, in this same book in Acts 23, in the first part of the chapter, he said, I have lived with a good conscience till this day. Now, when Saul was allowing Stephen to be stoned, and when Saul persecuted the Christians, he thought that he was doing God a favor. Now, he did. He thought he was doing God a favor. He was a dedicated religionist. And he was a fanatic... We would say, in our language, he said he belonged to the straightest sect. We would say that he was a religious fanatic. And he was so dedicated to his religion that he consented to the death of believers and Jesus worshipers because he thought Jesus was an imposter. He thought Jesus was an enemy to his religion and the religion of his fathers. And so he thought that he was doing God a favor. He thought that he was serving God when he consented to the death of Stephen and contributed to the death of many saints. And he put many in prison. Now God just knocked him down. Now God's not, God doesn't knock everybody down. Sometimes God lays a man flat of his back. He won't look up any other way. Some of us, Refuse to look up until God puts us flat on our back. Sometimes some of us refuse to recognize God until God takes something we love away from us. And then we recognize God. Now I don't know what God may do to you if you have a mother that's praying for you and you are rebelling against God. And you know that you should go to church. And you know that you should listen to your mother when she advises you to be born again. Or your wife or your loved ones. Whoever it is. You keep on fighting. You keep on rebelling. One of these days God may deal very harshly and drastically with you. Now you remember. If God can't. Now listen. If God can't get you to stop and listen to Him by being good to you, then God can try the rod, the lash, the hospital bed, the wrecked automobile, the burned out house, the loss of a job, a death in the family. God works in mysterious ways. And His ways are not our ways. His ways are so much higher and so much greater than ours than the heaven is the earth. Now, you may not understand why God does certain things as God does. But just remember, it's God and it's His business. And it's not your business or mine. Now, the thing that I want to impress upon you is this. God acts suddenly. And many times when God acts suddenly, He acts drastically. And I beg you today, if you're listening to me, and you're not a born-again child of God, and you are under conviction, and you know that you're under conviction, I beg you to surrender your heart to Jesus before God is compelled to act drastically, suddenly, in your case. Now, when Saul found himself on the ground, this big, mighty... Now, when I say big, I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about he was tall. They say he was a very short man. I'm not talking about he weighed 200, 300 pounds. I, they say he was a very small man. I don't know. But I'm saying he was a giant. Religiously, he was a giant. And when this big religionist found himself flat on the ground, and he knew that no man did it, he knew that a shining light did it, then he said, Who art thou? Who art thou? He heard a voice saying, he heard a voice saying, Saul, and he said, who art thou? And the voice said, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus. Didn't beat around the bush, he just said, I'm Jesus. Now remember, he was on the way to Damascus to arrest the Jesus worshipers. 
And the voice said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And from that time on, when Saul said, What wilt thou have me to do? That's in verse 6. You notice that. Saul was trembling. He was astonished. And he asked a question. What wilt thou have me do? From that question forward, Saul did not open his mouth. He said, What wilt thou have me to do? And that's the last thing he said. From then on, Jesus did the talking. Saul did the obeying and the listening. And he was saved. God spoke to Ananias. And he went where Saul was, and he instructed him, and he was saved. And he became the mighty preacher instead of a persecutor. Up until that time, he persecuted the Jesus worshipers. Now, he's one of them. And it happened suddenly. Now, I beg you today with the radio, if you're not a born-again child of God, let me say this before I leave that. Now, I said God does not always knock people down. He doesn't. He doesn't. God does not always speak with a shining light. He doesn't. Many times he speaks in the still, small voice. The still, small voice. And he calls in tenderness and in kindness. And if you listen, he'll save you. But as I said, if you rebel and refuse, and you go on in your stubborn way, God can change His goodness and His kindness to wrath. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. You read that in Romans 11. Romans 11. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. God wants to be good to you, and God wants to be good to me. But if we, re if we refuse to come to Jesus and be born again through His goodness and through the kindness, then God can call us through severity. And God can use a severe method to bring us to our knees. And I warn you, if you have a praying mother and a praying daddy, husband, if you have a praying wife, wife, if you have a praying husband, parents, if you have praying children, children, if you have praying parents, it is possible, altogether possible, and it's good sound Bible doctrine for me to say, that it is possible for us to pray our loved ones under conviction. We can't be saved for them, but we can claim them for Jesus. And if we live right and pray right, he'll save them. Paul, this man said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. We'll talk about that later. Father... That man, that woman, boy or girl, daddy, mother, whoever it is, under conviction, deep in conviction, move upon their heart mightily, O oh Lord, move mightily upon their heart, and save the soul that's nearest hell. May all who are convicted hear the voice of God, and repent and believe, and be born again now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.